And I'm going to go ahead and read to you something very powerful this morning. You may not recognize it right at first. All the Word of God is powerful. But in the book of Genesis is the account of creation. And I'm not only rejoicing today because God created healing in Judy, but I see her mother back here after a long stay in the hospital, and she's back made whole. We're going to see a lot of folks come back made whole. Made whole in the name of the Lord. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void and darkness. Everybody say darkness. How many of you understand darkness? Let me say it another way. How many of you have had some darkness in your life at one time or another? Yeah. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness and called the day the light day, and the darkness he called night. And I want you to notice very closely this next little phrase, and the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the first day. I want to preach to you a little bit on handling darkness. You may be seated, and I want, I want to talk to all of you that have a little dark cloud in your sky. I want you to hear what the Word of the Lord says. I've cut out some of the activities we had here today to get to the Word because I think this is important for somebody here. When I got to the office today, I went to work on something I had been feeling this week, and it was changed in that office before I got in here. And this is what I feel God has for somebody this morning. It's interesting to me that the Lord spoke through His Word that the evening and the morning were the first day. In verse 8, it said, the evening and the morning was the second day. And in 13, it says the evening and the morning was the third day. Verse 19 said the evening and the morning was the fourth. 23 said the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And verse 31 said the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And before I start preaching, I'm going to read you a scripture you need to hold on to. His anger endureth but a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. I want to show you a difference here, if I may, that humans equate things a little different than what God did. Brother Joey, it says that, that we humans equate day with newness, we equate it with hope. We think in the day there's freshness every new day, fresh mercy, fresh compassion. Everything's better in the daytime. Anybody ever, ever noticed that life seems to be a little easier at day, in the day hours than it is in the night hours? And, and to us, our days begin with the dawn and the rising of the sun. And our day continues until the darkness covers the sky in the evening. We equate nighttime a little different than daytime. We look oftentimes at night as representative of evil. You know, evil lurks in the night. It lurks in the darkness. We, we, we identify the night with trouble. We talk about sin and fear and uncertainty. And most of the time in the nighttime is when things get worse instead of get better. That's in human thinking. And so in the day that there's men's mood and feelings that tend to happiness and positivity and confidence and productivity. But when night approaches, man's moods change. And it tends, and I've lived some through some, some dark places. I know what I speak of. Uh, it gets harder to deal with at night when you're trying to go to sleep, when you're trying to get a good night's rest. And the pervasive thoughts that 
uh, your difficulty has brought, the darkness has brought. They race through your mind and they take liberties with your mind. And when night approaches, we tend, if there's any in us, depression comes out and negativism and fear comes out and insecurity. And I don't know if I'm the only one, but I've turned my face to the pillow many a time and shed some tears without saying a word to anybody because it just seems like in the nighttime hours, it's hard to handle stuff. It just really is. And so... In, in the night, burdens are heavier and sickness is worse and trouble is magnified and loneliness gets unbearable. I, I have a mother who will see this on live streaming or she'll watch it sometime today so she can testify that I'm telling the truth. I call her often because I know that since my dad passed, the loneliness of, of loss and, and not being with dad has created some terrible times and, and I know instinctively that it gets worse at nighttime in the dark hours whenever you're all alone and you're 85 86 years old and you got to deal with stuff then loneliness is it comes out stronger at night I'm not going to preach negative. I'm, I'm trying to draw uh, a little differentiation here for you to see what God wants to tell somebody. Isaiah said it this way. He said, with my soul have I desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me. I have desired you because I can't deal with it by myself. I desire you because it gets tough. I desire you because the enemy wants to come and plague my mind when there's darkness hanging overhead. And I'm not talking about physical darkness all the time. I'm talking about the darkness of a trial, the darkness of a sickness, the darkness of, of, of a storm, the darkness that comes to the mind, and the darkness that comes to the spirit. And so uh, Job said it like this. You know, I don't know about you, but, but it seems like I've lain awake at night Brother Fuller, and there's times that I would think, I wish it would hurry up and get daylight. I, I get busy, I can deal with stuff. I get moving, I don't have to think about stuff. I don't have to walk with this heaviness on me. And I wish for the morning. Job said, when I lie down, I say, when shall I arise? And the night be gone. Look at it. And I'm full of tossings to and fro until the dawning of that next and new day. One lady that was struggling with a terminal illness, Brother McMain, that I read about, said, I can make it okay during the day, but I hate the loneliness of the night. And even Jesus, knowing, knowing, and I believe this with all my heart, Brother Jim, I believe this, that the Lord, knowing our dread of the night, speaking about heaven, said, there's not going to be any night there. There's not going to be any darkness there. It's a reassurance that comes from God that says, I know how you feel about dark places, but when you get up here, there's not going to be any dark places because he is the light of that city. My message is this. Man's day is morning until evening. And that's the way that we live life as humans. But God several times in creation made it very clear that God's day is evening until morning. Because he said in the evening and the morning was the first and the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth day. That means, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost right here. That means that God's greatest work is done during man's weakest hour. God's greatest work is done in the greatest times of fear. God's greatest works are done during the hour of man's greatest uncertainty and during the worst of man's hours of time. God creates from the evening until the morning. Did you hear what I just said? I said God creates from the evening until the morning. What did he have to make on that first day or the second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth? Whatever it was, he started with nothing. I said he started with nothing. And yet, 
in the hour when he had nothing to work with, he created the most magnificent creation that we enjoy every day. And I'm here to tell you that when you are struggling under the cloudy darkness of whether it's a physical night or whether it's a storm of emotion or it is some illness that you can't handle or whether it is some trial that you are walking through, I want to convince you this morning that God said, my day is not like your day. I never sleep. I never slumber. But from evening when you start feeling bad to morning when you start feeling better, I perform miracles. I create wonders. I do things nobody else can do. I give power to the weak. I give strength to the faint. I give encouragement to the discouraged from the evening until the morning. Somebody clap your hands with me right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Satan wants to overwhelm us. But God said the evening time says to us that it's God's time to create a new day. Hmm? That's our name, isn't it? New Day Family Fellowship. We didn't just come up with that. God knows how to give us newness. Huh? James, you went into the hospital almost begging, no, please, no, no cancer, no bad report, no this, no that. A little bit of a dark cloud hanging there. But when you came out, you couldn't stand yourself. You was cooking for everybody. You was loving on everybody. You was putting out a tweet or a, tw- uh, or, 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 or a text a minute because you were happy. Who made you happy, James? It was God who was working in the middle from the evening till the morning, creating things that we can't create doing things we can't do, undoing things that we can't do. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying here this morning? Oh, we're going somewhere. God knows how. Everybody say, God knows how. There's some of you I'm talking to you. I've talked to you individually, and now I'm talking to you from this pulpit. I can't help it that I know all your problems. I'm your pastor. When I go pray and God says, go preach this, I cannot back away from it because I know all about what you're going through. God's having me to preach this so you'll walk out of here and not be afraid in the darkness. So you'll be able to walk with your head high under the cloudy darkness of the present storm or the sickness or the illness or the injustice or the sin or the problem that's going on in your life. I want somebody to hear me right now. The enemy wants to overwhelm you with spiritual darkness. Hmm? Now, anybody feeling the Holy Ghost in here? I didn't come here to preach you a pretty sermon. I didn't. I came here to give you something from the Lord. He wants something different than the enemy wants. Satan wants, it's amazing how he equates our physical darkness. I'm talking about our emotional darkness, our darkness within our flesh. Okay, I might as well, I got to be me. Can you imagine how Jim Baker feels this morning? Been there and done that. It's no fun. Can you imagine how Charlene felt and Les felt when they got the word they got? And the enemy likes to jump right in the middle of that kind of darkness and start telling you it's over. You can't, you, it's never going to be any better. This is the worst it can get and it's not going to get any better. Because he wants you to give up under the cloud of darkness. He wants you to be overwhelmed by it. I'm preaching to some, I'm preaching to several somebodies here. He wants you to get to the place where oppression overcomes you and the things you feel in dark places cause you to quit on God or blame God. I am calling that out right now and saying, devil, you're a liar and you're the father of every lie. Let every demon in hell go to the backside of hell. There will be miracle. There will be healing. There will be wonders. There will be encouragement. There will be strength. God will come through. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. So preacher, what I do? I don't know what to do to handle my darkness. Some of you hadn't even named your darkness. You're very private people, and so you don't tell your darkness. Somebody, some people tell it everywhere. Some just don't say it. They just walk through it, and it's there, and it's very real. So what I do when I'm facing one of these darknesses in my life, 
When it's nighttime and not daytime. When it's not morning till evening and evening till morning. And, and, and it's my day and my night. And my night is bigger than I am. And I can't handle it by myself. Well, look, not many of us can. Not many of us can. But the Lord impressed me that there are three ways that you ought to handle your darkness. And i got to go back to the cross. Dave, i got to go back to the cross to teach this lesson here this morning. i got to go back to it because it's important. There are, there are things that happened to him. He died on a bloody cross. They laid him in a sepulcher. It was dark. It was depressing times. It was, it was hard for those that followed him. People that left their boats and left their businesses and left and, and, and gave their allegiance and their, their followership to him. People that, that did their best to live like he wanted them to live and, and walk like he wanted them to talk. And here they are with the darkest time of their life. And the Bible said the first day of the week in John 20, Mary Magdalene came early. But I noticed those next few words, when it was yet dark. And there was something symbolic in that to me. She came when it was yet dark. You know why she came? She was overcome with grief. She was, she was grieving the loss of something precious. She was thinking about how it used to be. She was thinking about what should have been. She was thinking about who he was and what he was to her and to her family and to all the families that followed Jesus. And she came in the dark. How many of you believe she was heartbroken? Do you not know that she was depressed? Do you not know she was feeling loss? Do you not know that she was ready at times to give up and say, what's the use? If he couldn't do it, nobody can. Hello? And there she was, Brother Joey, grieving in the dark and crying in the dark. And I want you to know that when she got there, the stone was gone. I'm going to put something in your thinking here. In her state of mind, she said, oh, how great is this in our vernacular? How great is this? I'm already broken to pieces. It's already dark enough I've lost him. And now thieves have come and they've stolen his body. It just gone from bad to worse. But that's how the darkness does you. It makes you think everything gets progressively worse. It makes you think on top of what's happening, even if you pray, that it doesn't work. And, and there's a thievery going on. And the enemy's stealing everything you've got and taking away the dignity of life. And she came with that in her mind. I'm going to prove that through Scripture. But here's what the Lord impressed upon me. And it may mean nothing to some, but it's going to mean something to somebody. Why did she do it? I'll tell you why. She came to the last place she saw him. <sighs> Y'all didn't get that. She came to the last place that she laid her eyes upon him. And grieving in the dark with the stone rolled away. I'm going to tell you trouble seems to multiply when it gets dark. Huh? I don't care if it's a darkness of unbelief. Hmm? Oh, unbelief grows by leaps and bounds in, in, in troubled times. In dark times. Is anybody getting this? Look, I don't care if you don't shout and run the aisle. I want you to get what I'm saying. I feel like I've got a message from the Lord for somebody to encourage you today. Trouble multiplies in the dark hours. It makes things seem bigger than they are in the dark hours. And here she was in her state of mind saying they've stolen his body. They've taken him away. And she ran back to Simon and John and she told them. And they both ran to see about this tragic theft that took place. I'm about to prove that in Scripture. They didn't come there because they th thought he was resurrected. Hello? If I can prove that with Scripture, will you receive it? They didn't come there. They came because a broken lady was riding life through under a cloud that they were under. 
And darkness was covering their minds and covering their spirit. And John looked first, and he ran down, entered the tomb, saw the clothes and the linen that had been wrapped. And then Simon went in to see for himself, John 20 and 8. Then went also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. What did he see and what did he believe? He saw the clothes and he believed that the body of Jesus had been stolen. Hello? Gets worse in the dark. It's easy to believe negative things when you're in the dark. It's easy to confess negative things when when the sun hadn't shone in a while. Please hear me today. Please hear me. I'm telling you, we 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 have a lot of times we... We will convince each other. And and the enemy will convince us of things when it's dark in our lives that are not true. We preach that he believed that Jesus was risen when he went in and saw it. But let me give you the scripture. Same passage. Very next verse. John 20 and 9. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. And then the disciples went away again to their own home. Let me paint you a picture. They came there because they were under the darkness and they didn't know what else to do. And all three of them came to the last place they saw him. And then they were convinced because they didn't know that he was going to rise again. They didn't yet know the scripture decreed that he would rise again. And they went away again into their own home. They believed that his body had been stolen. Their night just got darker. Their flickering hopes were being snuffed out. They felt heavier in the dark. They felt an unbearable circumstance in the dark. And they went away and they said it's over and they gave up and they said we can't do this anymore I'm talking about Peter and John they left and went home you better believe if they thought he was resurrected they would have been dancing and shouting and looking around for him everywhere they went home depressed they went home down because the old enemy always tries to make us see things through the prism of the flesh. But we haven't yet seen what's really happening when we're walking under a cloud. Because there is a reality that we see. But there's a reality we can't see. And the reality we can't see is greater than the reality we see. I don't care what the doctor says. I don't care what the lawyer says. I don't care what circumstance says. There is a God that has a reality yet to come you're going to see that will undo everything that the devil has said to you in the dark Mm. okay slow down brother chance get this across they believed his body had been taken but look at verse 11 but mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping now the first way you handle the dark is you go back to where you last saw him Hmm? You go back to the last place you heard his voice. You go back to the last place you felt his touch. You go back to where you had an encounter with him. You go back to the memories of when he was with you. And they had done that. Now two of them ran away because trouble says it's worse in the dark. And Brother Tim, I love this. Mary didn't go home. The Bible said she stood there weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down again and looked into the sepulcher. You know what that tells me? Wasn't any quit in that little lady. It was dark, but she hadn't given up. It was bad, but she hadn't gone home. It it, it didn't seem like it was going to get any better, but she didn't run from it. Ooh, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost. She didn't run from it. She wouldn't go home. She wouldn't give up. She wouldn't give in. And I'm going to tell you why. Somebody, somebody lean just a little bit forward and hear Brother Chance right now. I want to give you something very powerful. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as an eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and they shall not faint. It doesn't matter what's going on, how dark it is, how thick the darkness. Don't go home. Don't run away. Don't give up. 
Don't turn back. Just if even if you're crying, you just bend down and look again because it ain't over until God says it's over. Hallelujah. 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 This could do for some of us who have been around a long time in here. We need to learn this today. Amen. She just kept crying, but she wouldn't leave. Huh. And two angels looked at her, Randall, and said, Why are you crying? And she said, What? Not nope. he's resurrected. She said, Because they've taken my Lord. But I don't know where to find him. My skies got darker. They've taken him. And the angels didn't speak next. She just turned finally to go. And the Bible said she saw Jesus standing there with her. Somebody's got to hear me right here. She saw Jesus standing there with her. In the darkness, she saw Him. Huh? In the middle of a trial, she saw Him. In the middle of a gagging feeling, she saw Him. In the middle of a broken heart, she saw Him. When it couldn't get any worse, she saw Him. My Lord. In the darkness, she didn't just see Him, but the Bible said He called her name. Hallelujah. Woo! In the darkness, He called her name. While her heart was breaking, He called her name. When she was walking through fear, He called her name. Lord Jesus, I'm preaching and I know, but i got to stop and say it. Lord Jesus, I want you to call Charlene and Les's name in this dark hour. I want you to call Jim Baker's name in this dark hour. I want you to call the name of those who are walking through the terrible times that they walked through this morning. I want them to see Jesus in the darkness. I want them to hear His voice in the darkness. I want them to fall at His feet in the darkness. You listen to this preacher. If she had given up James and walked away, she would not have seen Him. If she had turned and walked away with John and Simon at that moment in time, she would not have heard his voice and she would not have heard his name, call her name. She did two right things. Two. Number one, and I'm saying this to people this morning, and I'm not just talking to Les and Charlene. I'm not just talking to Pam and Jim Baker. I'm talking to some of you that haven't told anything to me and some that have. I'm going to tell you there's two things she did that every one of us has got to do when the skies get dark and things get scary. You got to go back to where you felt him last. You got to go back to where you encountered him last. You got to go back to the last touch you had from him. You got to remember how good he is. <laughs> you got to remember how it felt whenever he washed your eyes with tears and you woke up seeing. You got to remember how it feels when the burden falls away and the chains fall to the ground. You got to remember what it's like when he said you're healed or he said you're delivered or he said you won't have to go there anymore or he fixed that problem beyond what you could fix it. I'm preaching to somebody. You got to go back. That's the first thing. And the second thing you got to do is you got to wait praying and crying until he comes to you in the darkest hour because when you can't get to him he knows how to get to you and you just stay right there with a broken heart with weeping eyes with trying circumstances with fear in the air you just keep on praying even if you Keep on crying. You just keep on praying because in a little while you're going to hear him call your name. And when he calls your name, you fall at his feet and it ain't over until he gets through. Right. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You got any people walking through dark places, I want you to go get them this. And I'm not trying to sell CDs. We'll give you one. You go get it. And you give it to him. Because the Lord gave me this in that office today. And he said, that's the first two things you got to do. You've got to go back to where you saw me, touched me, felt me last. And then you've got to wait on me. Paul said in Romans 8, 24, We are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. What a man seeth, why does he hope for it? 
But if we hope for what we see not, <laughs> then we do with patience what? We wait on it. Hope becomes faith. Are you hearing me? It doesn't become little faith. It becomes great faith. You got to go from hope to faith. You can't do that unless you're going to stay right there. No, devil, you're not moving me. I'm quitting. I'm not running away. I'm not turning back on God. I'm not going to denounce what I have and who I know. I'm going to wait right here until the Lord gets through with what He's going to do. For likewise, oh, I love this. He said, we, we don't need, we, why do we, would we hope for something that we see? He said, hope for something that you don't see. But he said, then we, with patience, wait for it. And the next words, likewise, everybody say the Spirit of God. When you wait on it, what does the Spirit of God do? Everybody say it helps us. He, it said the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Infirmities can be physical, spiritual, emotional. Can be a lot of things. But you just stay right there. And you wait on God. And when you do, the Spirit of the Lord is going to come. Lord, I don't preach this in vain this morning. I'm preaching this and you never meant for your word to return void. I'm praying that it'll sink down in somebody's spirit, mind, and heart today. The Spirit helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. We just wait and we wait and we wait and we wait until the Spirit passes by. Until we hear Him call our name. Until we fall on our face and God lays a hand upon us on us. Hey, look, don't confess the weakness. Don't confess the circumstance. Don't confess the hopelessness that you feel and the helplessness that you, that you feel. Confess Jesus Christ and the power that is in that name. Confess that I'm going to wait right here. I'm going to go back. Where did you feel him last? More than likely you failed him at the church or at an altar. That can be in your home. You failed him somewhere in prayer, somewhere in worship. So you go back there and you wait. Are y'all patient with me to let me deliver what the Lord gave me to somebody here today? You wait right there. I don't care how bad it is. I don't care how hard it is. I don't care how long it takes. Everybody say, wait on the Lord. Go back to where you saw him. Say it. Go back to where you saw him. Go back to where you felt him. Go back to where you touched him. Huh? Go back to where he demonstrated his power to you before. Huh? You go back to there. Listen to me. The Holy Ghost is talking to somebody. Let me give you one more thing before I close. They thought they were dead men. The Bible said the ship was already breaking up. Storm lasted all through the night. You want to see grown men cry? Let them think about not going home to their wife and their children. Let them think about that it's over. Men on that ship had wept. Men had begged. I'm preaching to people who have wept and begged and confessed and done everything you know to do. Brother, Brother Simon's alluded to that earlier. You, you, you prayed about this kind of stuff. This thing that's, this, that's got a cloud over your life. And, and now, now it's evening time. Mm -hmm. And it goes on into the night. And then it becomes the darkest hour between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. The darkest hour of the night. I hope you're preaching along with me here. They, they were tired from the struggle. They were weary from the battle. But in the darkest hour of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the water. Because your problem may petrify you, but it doesn't faze Him. It may be so huge that you can't make your way past it, but it's never that big with Him. Listen to me. At two to four in the morning, He comes walking in the darkest hour. Now, you know what we've said to each other over time? This is different for me on a Sunday morning, but I told you, and I hope you learn it. I'm going to preach to where the need is and what God says. 
I'm not going to can something and come in here and preach it so you'll think I'm a good preacher. Forget it. I've already been down that road. It don't work. But I'm talking to somebody right here. We used to say to each other, don't ask God why. That means you're questioning God. We've heard that. We've all said that. We preach, don't ask why. Be patient. Just suffer what you're going through with patience. Just hang in there. But don't ask why. Don't question God. Well, I want to beg to differ with that today. 1 Peter 2, 21. Even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us, everybody say, an example. That we should do what? Follow in His steps. You want to know what to do? I've told you two of the three. You go back to where you saw him, you felt him, you touched him. You'll wait patiently, even if you're weeping and praying and crying. <laughs> and now we come to his example. My Lord, I'm feeling something here. He said you were called to follow his steps. Listen, he left us this example. It was his darkest hour. Falsely accused, paraded naked before a mob of unruly people embarrassed in front of his own mother and stripped down and made naked in front of his mom, a grown 30-something-year-old man, humiliated with spit running down his face, skull pierced with a crown of thorns, beaten with horrible stripes, railed on, mocked on, jeered, scourged, his side ripped open with a sword. And the Bible said at the sixth hour, darkness came over the land. Darkness! Now I want you to listen to our example. It's the darkest day of his life. It was about the sixth hour. Darkness was over all the earth until the ninth hour. The sun was darkened. The veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands... I commend my spirit. Unto thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. I'm going to tell you that third thing you got to do to handle your darkness, you got to put it all in the hands of your heavenly Father. Hello, somebody. You got to put it all in the hands of your heavenly Father. <laughs> when, when, you, when you have gone back to the place and you've wept and you've cried and you're standing there wondering if this is not the darkest, I hope I never see it. You've got to do what Jesus did in the darkest hour. The Bible said, He said, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I want to tell somebody it's alright to ask why as long as as you commend your spirit into His hand. Hello? When you don't understand, put it in His hand. <laughs> when you don't know what to do, put it in His hand. When you don't think that it's any hope at all, and it's bigger than you are, somebody say, put it in His hands. Somebody say, put it in his hands. Now, I want everybody in this building to think of the darkest place in your life right now. And when you're thinking of it, I want you to lift your hand. Because everybody has them, some worse than the other. But if you've got any dark place anywhere in your mind, soul, spirit, or life, financially, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, that the darkest little place, I don't care how small it is, when you're thinking of it, hold your hand up. Hold it up. Now, I want you to say this out loud with that hand up. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I put it in your hands, God. This is one area I can't deal with. This is something I can't do. This is something bigger than I am, God. I put it into your hands. I can't handle this by myself. I'm going to put it in your hands. If you'll put it 
in his hands. Let me tell you what there's going to be. There's going to be a resurrection. Hallelujah. I said there's going to be a resurrection because he put his spirit into the hands of the almighty, eternal, supernal God. Three days later, there was a resurrection. And that same Jesus came out of the grave. That same Jesus rose up in power and in victory. And I'm going to tell somebody here, I'm not looking at the day you're bowed down under your dark cloud. I'm looking at the time that you put it in his hands and just in a short moment you're going to be rejoicing because God is going to raise you up in the midst of your struggle. He's going to raise you up. Clap your hands to the Lord if you believe it. Hallelujah. 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 Weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming. Can you say that? Joy is coming. If you quit fussing and griping and complaining and saying it ain't ever going to happen, I give up. I quit. I don't want to try anymore. I'm going to run away from this. It's not doing me any good. If you'll just stop all that and say, Father, I'm putting this in your hands. I'm putting this in your hands. I'm going to keep praying and I may cry. And I'm going to keep praying. I'm going back to a place of prayer where I last felt you. I've been noticing some of you, and you're going to know what I'm saying when I tell you this. I've been noticing some of you when you're under heaviness, you come right here around this part of the altar. Because we, we, we've talked about it among ourselves. Before we ever came in and took this church over, we felt something standing right here. Something powerful. Something close. Something good. Something wonderful. You just go back to that last place you felt that. Maybe in, at, the, at the divan on your house. Maybe in the back room. Maybe under an oak tree in, in the field somewhere. Maybe on, in a car. Go drive down that same strip. I'm the, I'm the crazy one that's done that. Go drive where you felt God. I remember a place I pulled over, couldn't see no more, crying too hard. My son was going to die, they said. I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. I couldn't handle it. It was dark. It was dark, Brother Simons. But I pulled that car over <laughs> in that same spot. Hallelujah. And the Lord gave me the only song I ever wrote in my life. The darker the night, the brighter the light that Jesus shines on you. I walked all alone. I was so far from home. But Jesus came to me. Why did I stray? Why did it happen that way? Tell me how, Lord, can this be? But the darker the night, the brighter the light that Jesus shines on me. And He's reaching over to turn on the light even as I speak. If somebody in here will go back to where you felt Him and you'll begin to wait on God with nothing in your heart except waiting there till He does something. And then you'll lift your hands and say, God, into your hands I'm putting things in my life. And I promise you there's going to be a resurrection. Can you put me, and I'm closing, in Psalms 22 and 1. Psalms 22 and 1. And one through three. David's recording. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so, thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night seasons, and I am not silent. But, everybody say but. Somebody read that out loud with a little passion. But what? Come on, somebody say it. Oh, you're not convincing me. Come on, say it like you mean it. Thou art holy. Oh, thou that. <laughs> what? The praises. Everybody say the praises. So here you are. You've come back to the place. You've been waiting on God. You hadn't seen it yet, and you're still crying. But right here's where the key is. You throw your hands up. You've committed your spirit into His hand, and you start praising God in hell. You start giving God glory in hell. You live on for God. You give it everything you've got. Because it's not you that's going to get this done. It's going to be God that gets it done. Somebody shout amen. Moni, would you come? So I'm, I'm telling you how I feel and what I've learned. I don't care how dark it gets. 
I don't care how rough my road is. I don't care how troubled I am. And I've been there. I don't care how hard my life gets. I don't care how deep my valley gets. I don't care how painful the wounds of my life are. God, I'm going to praise You. I'm going to praise You. I know You're there. I know if I praise You, You're going to come help me. I know if I praise You, You're going to meet me there. (laughs) And as I close, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to see these men falsely accuse the whole multitude against them. They tore off their clothes. They beat them. They cast their bloody bodies into a prison. They fastened their feet in stocks and about midnight in pain, bloodied, going through dark, dark times. Let me use my imagination. A weak, cracked voice, Coy. All of a sudden you could hear from the back of that prison cell, Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him in the morning. Praise Him in the noontime. I'm going to praise Him. I'm going to praise Him. I'm going to praise Him when the sun goes down. I don't know if that's what they were singing, but I do know, Joey, they started praising the Lord. It was the only place they could go to in prison. But they knew He inhabited praise. And at midnight, they began to sing and praise the Lord. And the Bible said the doors were opened. Not only theirs, but everybody around them. Because God does His greatest works in men's darkest hours. Some of you are due to greatness. You're you're, you're headed for greatness, but you can't be great until you've suffered. Greatness doesn't come until you've walked through suffering. And I'm here to tell you today that God's going to be there. So I leave you with three things. I could have preached, oh, I had a message ready. God is. And we could have danced and shouted and preached about God is. But with nobody looking, I wonder how many of you feel like, because every time after church somebody said this was for me, well, I'm going to get the jump on you today. Nobody looking but me and God. How many of you would lift your hand and say, Brother Chance, I really believe this message is for me today. I see hands everywhere. I see them everywhere. It's for me. It's for me. It's for me. Stand with me, would you?